you guys hear me? Oh, yeah, there it is. There it is. Um, oh, hello. Let's, so, let's go ahead and get started. Um, so, hi, I'm Harper. Um, I think that you guys saw those posters that were up around Johannesburg. Um, I got Facebooked and Twittered, and everyone sent pictures. It was really exciting, so thanks for that. Um, today, I'm going to talk about a couple things. So, three things, really. The first one I'll talk about in a little bit is, is building a great team. Um, the second one will be practicing failure. And the third will be facilitating community. These are all things that we spend a lot of time on on the campaign. But first, I want to talk about my favorite topic in all of the world, myself. So uh, does anyone know who these guys are? Yes? OK, uh, let me see some hands. How many? OK, a good, good bit. So that's, that's uh, Steve Jobs. Uh, Steve Wozniak and then uh, and John Scully. And this is, this is the first computer that I got when I was a young kid. Um, and I, I programmed on it a lot. We built a lot of games and a lot of fun stuff. Um, has anyone read this book? Yes? No? Okay, a few, very small amount. So this, you guys should all check out this book. It's called Hackers. It's by Stephen Levy. It's this history of kind of computer hackers and history of technology starting in the 60s in MIT. Um, the exciting thing about this was um, when I read it, I was like, wait a minute. All of these values that these guys have in the 60s and 70s and 80s that built the world that we live in, um, I have sharing, openness, collaboration, um, this idea of a hands-on imperative. I was really excited about these things. And I realized that I'm a hacker. This is an exciting realization for me. Uh, my parents were not so excited. Um, and so then I explained to them, obviously, that you know, you don't, all, not all hackers are criminals. Um, all criminals are criminals. But not all hackers are criminals. Um, I also you know, spend a lot of time coding. And so in my world, kind of hacker and coder are synonymous in a lot of ways. And so having this kind of identity really helped. Um, and so some time passes, and I joined this company. Who here knows Threadless? Once again, hands. OK, good number of people know Threadless. Um, so the, for those of you who don't, I'll talk through it a little bit. Threadless was really exciting. Um, one of the most exciting things is apparently we invented crowdsourcing. We didn't know this at the time. And we went to this place here, MIT. And we're sitting there at MIT, and we're like, um, oh, hi, everyone from MIT. And they're like, oh, hi, Threadless. And then they're like, Threadless invented crowdsourcing. And we were basically like, crowd what? We had no idea what that meant. Um, but what we did is we took things like this and turned it into that. Um, and this was pretty easy. And we did it with really four kind of simple steps. Um, they were design. So people like you would design a really great design. And you would you just kind of create this this perfect design. And then you would upload it, and so you'd submit it to Threadless. And it sits on Threadless, and it's scored by all these great people. And then the design wins, and we find the best design, and then cash money falls from the ceiling. I, I mean, I guess that's what it did inside of the headquarters. Um, and we paid all the winners, and we, you know, we made a lot of money. It was really exciting. Um, and here's a great diagram of how it goes. You have an idea. You put that idea on a shirt. People talk about it, and then you get these gold chains. Pretty straightforward, right? Um, but the, the, the scale was really exciting. And so we started in 2000, and um, we just did all of, like we had so many people that are uploading designs, hundreds and hundreds of thousands. Um, we had millions of people voting. Actually, I should probably say a small number of people voting millions of times. And uh, we sold millions of t-shirts. This is super exciting, right? Um, the revenue grew from X to XX. I'm not allowed to talk about revenue, so that'll have to work. Um, and, but the best part was, and this is the best part about crowdsourcing, is we did none of the hard work. You guys all did, which was really exciting. And I'm sorry we don't ship to South Africa. Um, our technology stack was pretty straightforward. It was just PHP um, and MySQL. And this is you know, pretty easy and understood. This allowed us to do a couple things that were really important. Um, we were able to focus on the product. We didn't have to focus on technology, which I'll talk a little bit about later. Um, so around this time, I think it was around 2009, I realized all the goals that I had kind of set out to accomplish um, were done. I checked them all off. So I did what everyone should do is quit. Who here is quitting today? Let's see some hands. You can, OK, we have, come on, guys. I recommend doing this. It's really, really important to, for, you know, you, you get to experiment with uh, Vision Quest. Does anyone know what a Vision Quest is? OK, we have a few. So this is apparently a uniquely American thing where you go into the desert, you find your spirit animal and a bunch of mescaline. Um, that's not what I did. I did not do that. I, I joined a venture capital firm, um, which I think is roughly the same experience. Um, 
And really what I did is I went around and I, I really studied a couple things. The first things I study is how do you build sustainable businesses? How do you build good teams? Um, and how do you do this and, and merge technology into our everydays? So this is something that I did. And, and around the same time, um, this group of people found me. And this is the Obama campaign. And so this is about 2011, really exciting time. Um, this is the guy that actually uh, reached out and got a hold of me. Excuse me for a second. His name is Michael Slaby, and Michael Slaby is actually, uh, he's a really great guy. Um, we became really good friends. The thing about Michael Slaby um, is he was a CTO in 2008, and so he was the one that really started this whole thing on political technology, really started getting more people involved, um, and his background is much in politics. He's worked in politics his whole life, and so in, in, in 2010, 2011, when they were like, who do we need to be the next CTO, they were like, well, this guy. <laughs> so <laughs> let's just go back and forth there for a second. Um, this is my this is my campaign photo. This is like the official campaign photo. And I was like, guys, do I need a suit? And they're like, no, 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 no. And I'm just like, come on, I probably need a suit to meet the president. They're like, no, 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 you look great. Um, <laughs> and I think one of the reasons I was hired is because I looked like a tech guy. Um, and my worry is in 2016, we're gonna have all these people who are gonna try and find tech people that look like tech people, and they're gonna end up with homeless people <laughs> running the campaign's tech. So. This is, if there's a gradient there, right? So anyway, I was a CTO for 2012, um, and this was really exciting, and, and it was, I mean, super surprising for, for pretty much everyone. Um, what was exciting, though, for, for me was, was the opportunity, but the question I kept getting, mostly from my parents, was why? Why you? And I'm just like, come on, Mom, like, I'm serious, I'm really competent. But, the, but it's, a good, it's a good question to answer is why. And so let's dig into that a little bit. 2008, 2008, and I've talked about this with some of you already just in, in, the, in the audience. And um, In 2008, the iPhone was about a year old. Android phones had just been released to the market. Um, Facebook pages were created because of, the, of the Barack Obama's campaign. Um, Twitter was used by hippies, young people like yourselves. And um, all these things you know, were just kind of, the, the, they weren't status quo. They were just the things that were fancy, little gadgets in the corner. Um, in 2012, our parents are using them. This is weird, but it's also really important. So suddenly, you know, obviously this is in the U.S. In middle America, people are using Twitter. Android is huge. I know it's huge here as well. And all of these things became normal. Um, and so they needed someone that understood this. So I was describing the problem to my wife, who is Japanese, and she tells me this, which I actually have no idea what it says. Um, but it, it says this, mochi wa mochi ya, which is this crazy idea. The idea is that if you're looking for mochi, who here know, who knows what mochi is? Okay, one person. We'll go to the next slide then. So if you're looking for rice cakes, which are these really good little sweets, you need to go to the rice cake dealer. You don't go to the gra gas station or the supermarket. You go directly to the source. And so Michael Slaby, when he was trying to figure out how do we get technology, because 2012 is going to be about technology. We're no longer the startup. We're no longer the insurgent. We are the enterprise. So how do we find technology that, that fits that? Well, you have to go to the engineers. And so we needed to get software development done, so we had to go to the software developers to do this. Um, now, this is not a crazy concept, but apparently it is, um, because no one had done it before. And you guys all laugh, but I, I would like you to look at your organizations as well. Um, so obviously it worked, all right? We, you know, yes, we code. Who here loves GitHub? Okay, there should be more hands up. Um, so I had to do a couple things. The first thing I had to do is hire a lot of people. So I hired about 40 software engineers. I just stepped out and said, hey, who wants to work for the president? This was pretty easy, right? Um, and I hired them from all of these great companies. I want you guys to pay attention to the most important one. Um, and it was really, like, this was a pretty easy thing because I would get a friend. They'd say, hey, talk to this guy or talk to this young woman. And I'd, I'd, they'd get on the phone and I'd say, hey, do you want to work for the president? And they'd say yes. Or they would say, wrong team. That was pretty much it. Um, Overall, we had about 120 tech staff. And this is, this is really important because this is about 10 times what we had in 2008. Um, and so that's kind of the scale difference. Um, we started from absolutely zero. So when I walked in, there was no source code. There was nothing. There was no infrastructure. There was nothing left over from 2008. And remember, in 2008, all this stuff was invented. And we couldn't invent anything because we only had 18 months, which is a very short period of time. And so we had to focus on one thing only, and that is execution. We could not innovate. We had to only focus on execution. Um, I love this cake. So this is a cake. Uh, this, was, this was made by one of my, my ops guys 
Um, and uh, he brings it in like a couple weeks before the end of the campaign, maybe like a week. And everyone was just like, I can't eat that. <laughs> like, we all of a sudden became really super superstitious. And we're just like, if, what if we fuck it up? We, eat, we ate the cake. This would be terrible. So we win, right? And then after we won, they all ate the cake, which I thought was riskier, way riskier. <laughs> um, so anyway... We built what amounted to a platform. This was a pretty exciting thing to do. We, we did this because, you know, we wanted to, we, well, I'll talk about it in a second, but who here has heard of Narwhal? Some of, some of your media people asked about it this morning, so it obviously made a little bit of news here, but Narwhal was this, well, let's just jump into it. Well, oh, um, this is Jim Messina, the campaign manager photoshopped as a Narwhal. Um, we spent a lot of time um, engaging in humor because it was such a high-stress environment that we knew that if we weren't, if we lost fun, it wouldn't be worth it. So I'll just run through some of our various. Here's him as Harry Potter. Here's him as a giraffe. Um, and this is my favorite, him as a dragon. Anyway, um, so Narwhal, Narwhal is this concept. It was a pretty important thing. It was this idea that we could take an API and build that as our foundation that gave us the freedom to focus on the products. Now, this is a hard thing because most platforms are begat from a product. But we decided to start from a platform to build our products. Um, our products were pretty much all over the place, and all of these were kind of powered by Narwhal. So the first one was this thing called Call Tool. And Call Tool, what it did is it, it surfaced on the screen a, a bunch of numbers that you could call. And you'd call one, and it'd give you a kind of a survey, a script to read. We used this to get voter turnout, and we made millions and millions of calls with this in the last um, couple days of the campaign. Um, dashboard was kind of a CRM, so it allowed all of us to understand who our neighborhood volunteers are. Um, it was really exciting. You would log in, and you could find out who in your building or who in your neighborhood or who uh, on your block is also volunteering. And then you could invite them to participate with you. This gave us a lot of good geo data. It also allowed people to really participate together. Mobile apps were a really big deal, but the biggest deal for us was responsive web design. Um, so we had Android and we had iPhone mobile apps, but those are boring. What wasn't boring was the fact that every single one of our apps, internal or external, worked on any device you tried it on. There was a slide earlier that kind of said something about blah, 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 responsive is boring, or don't worry about the devices. No, you have to worry about the devices. And the exciting thing for me was this is an internal apps that were responsive, because we had millions of volunteers, and we didn't know where they were from. We didn't know what devices they were going to come with. So we needed to make sure that their phones, their computers, their tablets work with our products. Our contribution apps was, I like this one the best. Um, it was built by two guys, um, and it raised about $750 million. Um, so it's pretty good ROI. Um, <laughs> social was really exciting as well, but I think social is really boring, so I'm not going to talk about that. Let's talk about big data. Who here likes big data? OK. Um, so one of our big innovations, I said okay, because I'm, I'm going to disappoint everyone about big data in a second. So let's have a little bit of an intervention with that woman right there who loves big data. Um, so big data, big data is really exciting, right? Everyone talks about big data. I heard it a couple times today. Um, but the thing about big data is we focus on the big. And so the thing about it is it used to be hard. In 2007, when the term big data was really coined by all the engineers who were trying to solve these problems, um, while the big insurance companies were laughing at us because they've already solved them, um, we're talking about storage. And when, when we're talking about this today, every time I hear big data, there's a, there's a marketing exec in the back from Oracle who's like, yes. You know, and, and they're very excited because that you've bought into their marketing. So my challenge for you is to never say big data. Just say data. And if you want to talk about something being big, let's talk about questions and answers. And how can we talk about what the big answers are? Because honestly, big data is bullshit, but big answers are what you're looking for. So that's my intervention. Sorry. So obviously, the innovation was the data, right? We're not talking about big data. We're just talking about simple, plain old data. So let's talk about the media. I don't know if it's the same here, but in the US, the media loves data. So this is Obama campaign data, just the Google search I did. That's kind of boring, right? Let's, I mean, it's super boring. So let's change it. Micro-targeting. Who here knows what micro-targeting is? OK, a good group. I'll go through what it is in a little bit. Let's just zoom in there. What is that? I have no idea what's going on. <laughs> like, this is also my favorite. That's a, a horse holding a cat on a boat. Uh, 
obviously, micro-targeting is super exciting, right? People are just stoked about it. They love it. Um, I think it's cool, too. But the um, first thing is most of our interaction, most of our fundraising all went through email. Um, so social is, that's why I said social is boring. We didn't do a lot of social. We did, I mean, we did a lot of social. We had a great social team, but a lot of it was email. And, and this is a tweet from a friend of mine, Dan Sinker. Um, we've officially reached a point where emails from Obama and Biden now outnumber emails from actual people by a margin of two to one. Um, this, was se this was sent at the end of the campaign in 08. Um, nothing has changed. We still send a lot of email. Did anyone here get any emails from us? Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so we did this really cool thing called Quick Donate, um, where we sent very targeted emails to you. So this is an actual email from my inbox, and I think I have a laser. Yeah. So if you see this right there, 56 bucks. I have no idea why that was, but it was the amount that the model said I would be compelled to give. So I clicked it, and I gave 56 bucks immediately. And for me, as a, as a computer scientist, I'm like, why is it out of order? Um, but the main thing here, the innovation here that I think you guys should all take away is every time you click that link, the campaign takes money from your bank account with no confirmation. So when you go click this link, you're like, 250, click. All of a sudden, that money, your credit card is charged immediately. There's no, like, did you mean to click this link? <laughs> like, you, you pretty deliberately clicked on that link. Um, that's why it's also called Quick Donate, because it's very quick. Um, but the thing about this is this did about $250 million in donations because we took away that, that, that barrier to conversion. So check your conversion funnels. Um, you guys have seen this, right? Facebook Connect, login with Facebook. So we added that, and, and we said, you know, what are we going to do with all this data that we're getting? We were really excited about it. So what we did is we did what most people don't. We put that data inside of email. Here's another email that I actually got, um, and here's all the personalization points. Um, and so you can see North Carolina, my friend John Ruth, and my friend John Ruth is actually one of my best friends growing up. And so we went through and we looked at everyone who connected with Facebook. We looked at all of their likes. And we all have those people, some of you may be in the audience, that like every status update, right? We put those people over there. Um, and then we looked through all the people who kind of normally like all of your stuff. And then we went and looked at your photos and we saw who are you tagged with. And then we put this all together and we were able to find who you influence. And then we looked at who you influence and we found which one of you are inside of that battleground state. And my friend John just happened to be in North Carolina. And so then we sent emails to the people who influenced those people in the battleground states and we said, hey, why don't you just reach out and tell them to vote? Because there's one thing that Democrats always kind of screw up is we always forget to vote. So that little, it's not that funny. <laughs> I mean, it's kind of funny, but it's, you know, it's yeah, gore, when, right? Uh, anyway. Um, so we also did this with, uh, with SMS. And I was super worried about SMS because SMS is, like a lot of people say there's like 100% open rate with SMS. It's ridiculous. The open rate on SMS is insane. And so um, you know, we, we did a lot with SMS. And this is how I imagined it to be. Like I just imagined that it would, you, know, you're, you accidentally gay, you know, it just didn't work, right? But actually it worked perfectly fine and we did it on New Year's, which is one of our biggest fundraising days with SMS. And I'm absolutely positive it worked out like this. But this is the thing, is, is we used all of this great data, we used all of this targeting to, to increase the amount of money we raised. We used it to do better content distribution. Um, and the most important thing is we did much more efficient voter contact. Um, and that was really awesome. Um, but there's something that we are forgetting. Um, we needed to listen. This is a huge part of politics, a huge part of campaigns, is how do we listen? And so I was talking to a friend. Does anyone know who this is? I think it's just a bad picture, but this is Tim O'Reilly. He wrote, he publishes all the O'Reilly books. So I was at one of his conferences, and he was like, Harper, I'm really targeting, I mean, I'm really tired of micro-targeting. I want you to be focusing on micro-listening. And how do you focus on that? How do you, how do you, do th how do you ex execute on that? And so we started thinking about it, and we thought, well, we have all this technology for targeting. How do we use that technology to have a conversation? And so you already have this built into many of your ad platforms, et cetera. How do you do that to reach out and have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with your, with your consumer? So we did this a few ways, and I'll go through them real quick. On voter contact, um, this is an actual picture of a volunteer knocking on a door, actually ringing a doorbell, I suppose. And uh, um, that person would then have a conversation with the person they're, the, that, they, that they're interacting with. And maybe they're going to write down some information. Well, we can put that information to our databases so that the next time we have a conversation with that person, maybe it's by phone, that, w that can be a rich conversation. An example of this is we found that a veteran talking to a veteran has much greater lift than me talking to a veteran, or me talking to anyone, really. Um, 
But, you know, a- another example of this is a- a- an older person is, is pleased when a younger person calls and talks about politics. Um, this is all stuff that we backed up with data, and then when we find out various information about that person with the previous conversation, we can start ex- we can start executing on that with the next conversation. So having this constant loop with a one-on-one person is really important. Um, we did this with Twitter, and this is just kind of fun. Um, we did a similar thing as we did with Facebook, but with Twitter, where we went and found a co- like kind of the people that you influence inside of your world, and then we found the people who follow Barack Obama, and then we sent DMs. And we did the same thing with the first lady and uh, the vice president. I'll just read you my favorite here. Feeling kind of special, or feeling special because I got a DM from Joe Biden. He's kind of like American's drunken uncle. Um, We got a lot of this really big kick, really big lift on people just giving our message out to their friends. Um, This is really exciting, purely because we just reached out to them, and we hadn't done that before. Um, We did a lot with asking. We'd set up different uh, software, and then we'd ask a question. I'll I'll show you my favorite example of this later, but um, one of the things we did is, hey, what is the challenges? What is the ups? What is the good and bad about your day today? Then we could look at that, and then we could reach out to that person and solve the problem. We could start changing our program from the very top. This is actually Dashboard. Um, Dashboard, we had all, all of our volunteers use. It worked out really well. So largely listening worked really well, and it was something that we would, I think that's something that we'll continue to do in the future. Um, Our technology stack was pretty crazy. So we used this stuff, Python, Ruby, and we used, I mean, we just used a lot of stuff, but I'll go through it real quick. MySQL, um, we added everything else. Um, StatsD, does anyone here know StatsD? Okay, you guys should write that down and tell your tech team to start using this. This allows real-time metrics tracking across all of your platforms. it's very engineer focused, but it allowed us to correlate different things that we would never be allowed to correlate. Very exciting stuff. Um, we use Puppet and Vagrant, and because we're adults, we used Ubuntu. Um, <coughs> that's right. Um, the OFA framework, I like to call this um, the use all the things framework. Um, because basically, we just used whatever would solve the problem. This was really uh, pretty straightforward. Um, from an infrastructure standpoint, we were pretty, you know, we were pretty cloudy. Um, who here uses cloud? Okay, who here doesn't use cloud? There's like one or two. Keep your hands up. Those people hate money. Um, So we had about 200 products, and we had to deploy them all. Here's our infrastructure map. Um, Thousands and thousands of servers, and here's actually our infrastructure map, so... You're seeing just backups right now. This is all backup infrastructure. Okay, we're starting to get to the real stuff. And then my favorite part is coming up. Um, so right here, there's going to be two little guys here, right here and here. These are complete copies of what just scrolled by um, as testing and staging. Um, we could never have done any of this without cloud computing. Um, and we did it for just, I mean, you can even look, all the records are public. We did it for very, very little money. Um, and so obviously, there's some stats about what we actually were able to do. Um, and you guys, if you are anyone here is interested in, in ops or Amazon or anything like that, follow Scott. He's really great. Um, but we required the cloud to be successful. Without this technology, we could not have achieved what we actually achieved. So this is great. All this technology was very simple. We just did the thing, once again, that allowed us to focus on the problem, allowed us to focus on the products. We did not want to get stuck on a religious conversation about technology. Um, And one of the reasons for that is failure was ultimately not an option. And I joke about this all the time. People are like, what do you mean? And I'm like, well, we had to save the world. Imagine if the other guy won, right? We probably would have invaded South Africa. It would have been terrible. Um, (laughs) But we did two things to stop this. The first thing we did is we really aggressively invested in user experience. I'll talk about that in a little bit. And we also aggressively um, invested in testing, which I'll also talk about in a little bit. We practiced failure, which is one of my favorite topics to talk about, for about one month. And if you look historically, campaigns practice failure constantly. One of the things that we did is we did two or three mock election days with thousands and thousands of volunteers just to see what would go wrong. This was incredibly helpful. Um, on election day, it was largely you know, pretty chill. We could do no changes. Um, this is an actual uh, post-it note that I got, took a picture of on election day. Um, and this kind of explains how everyone was crazy. They're like running around. I learned the definition of frene- uh, frenetic that day. Um, but election day was pretty chilled out. We just kind of hung out in my office and relaxed. And obviously, we won, which is good. It was good. You're welcome. So let me now get into the meat of my presentation. (laughs) This is a good part. This is my favorite part. This is one of the most important lessons I learned from the campaign. I always forget about this part. 
So politics is super hard. Does anyone know who this is? This is John Maeda. Um, he was, he's the head of RISD College in Rhode Island. Um, he runs into my office one time. He visited the campaign. He runs into my office and he was like, look, Harper, politics are hard. Um, and I'm sure you have a lot of problems with politics because you guys, tech, was an insurgent group inside of the campaign. We weren't, we weren't normal campaign people. We weren't normal. We didn't really fit in. We were a lot older, um, all sorts of various things. And so he was like, look, the most important thing you can do and the one thing that has helped me as an outsider in my organization is manage by your inbox or, or manage by your outbox, not your inbox. And I, and I thought, you know, what does that mean? Because oftentimes we wait for emails to come in and then emails don't come in and we're like, why didn't they email me? And really stressful situation. And he was like, no, no, no. What you do is you look through your inbox and you're like, okay, so all these people have emailed me. Then you look through your outbox and if you quantify how many people or you start counting how many people you have emailed, I'm sure the people you're not emailing are the ones that you have adversarial relationships with. And so we, I started thinking about this, and I was like, well, that, yeah, of course, that seems silly. But then I started thinking, looking at my inbox, looking at the people that I felt like I had a problem with or had a problem with me, um, and I started noticing that I wasn't really emailing them, so I decided to try it. So I reached out. There was a, a particular person that I had a little bit of a problem with, or I didn't have a problem with. I just they were It was very adversarial. I reached out, and I just said, hey, man, uh, here's a status on the product real quick. Uh, hope things are well. And he said, his reply was, oh, my gosh, thank you for emailing me. And I was like, oh, I, I guess I'm not doing my job. Like, and it was this very simple thing, just emailing the people who are hard to email, the people who you're a little scared to email, really helped solve some of these big problems. So I, I recommend you guys do that. Um, okay, now into the meat. So the first thing we're going to talk about is building a great team. This is probably my favorite topic. Um, the second thing is practicing failure. Once again, a really good one. Um, and then the third one is how do you facilitate community? And we heard a little bit about community today, so hopefully I can help out to that conversation. So let's jump into building a great team. The innovation on the campaign was the team. No matter what department you're looking at, no matter who worked there, they were the best person we could possibly get. Um, and building a team is not easy, especially under time constraint. And you never have all of the time that you wished you did. Um, so this is kind of my rules for how to build a team. The first thing, and this is the hardest one, is pruning. You have to be ready to get rid of people. Um, and so you can't be afraid to fire people. Who here likes firing people? There's, I don't even see if there's anyone. That's good. Firing people totally sucks. Usually there's one like kind of guy, yeah, I do, and I'm always like Republican. Um, <laughs> but, but really, it's, it's, it's just not, it's not a good feeling, but you have to do it because if you have that person on your team that doesn't belong there or is bad, um, they're a poisonous person and they can break your whole team. Um, who knows this movie? ABC? Okay, this is Glenn, Gr Gary, uh, Glenn Ross. I've never actually seen it. Um, but... Always be closing comes from it. And you guys have heard always be closing, right? Well, I want to challenge that a little bit and change it to always be creative. One of the things that when I see hiring, people are like, yeah, 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 Rails developer, blah, 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 blah. That's not interesting. This is how we did it. Do you want to save the world? I mean, it was true. But also, creative, right? But the, the idea here is how do you make it so people are compelled to want to hear more about you and your team and your solution? How do you make it so people really want to be a part of that, where you're pushing people away? There was a great tweet by, uh, I don't know if you guys know Dwala. It's a kind of a, a, a microfinance kind of finance startup in Iowa. A great tweet from a guy that is trying to hire engineers in Iowa saying, I don't know what you guys are talking about. We're having to turn engineers away. It's easy to hire if you have an interesting problem. It's hard to hire if you're boring. So don't be boring. Who here knows this one? A's hire A's and B's hire C's? This is, a pretty, this is a pretty easy idea. Um, the idea is just hire people who are smarter than you. So A's obviously are the best, and so they should hire A's who are the best, and B's, you know, they always hire people below them so they can manage them and belittle them and do all that fun stuff. So with that said, who here is an A? Come on, guys. Only like four people? I think that's probably not true. Um, trust is a really, really big one. Um, I think this is one of the hardest ones to quantify. So I'm just going to leave it here with you guys need to figure out how to enable trust inside of your team. And I don't know the answer to that because it's different with every team, but this is one of the most important things. Um, measuring everything, I think metrics are a huge way to quantify the success of a team. It allows you to find success to say, look, this was very good. This was a great job. And to give credit, Harper did a great job, as I want to do. Um, diversity is, I think, one of the most important things. Um, it's very hard to find people um, sometimes, but you can't be afraid to hire people that look differently from you. Um, this is easy for me. 
just kidding. But it's actually really hard. So you, you go out there and you're trying to hire people that look differently from you. And oftentimes, especially in the US, your, your, your base of, of candidates will be all like white men. Well, my challenge is to really reach out and try and hire people that look differently from you um, because the internet is not composed of all white men. Weird. Um, and this isn't easy, especially in the US. I, I don't know about here. I, I haven't tried hiring here. But in the US, we have a really hard time with this. And so the first two, th the two things that I recommend is, first of all, try. That's the first thing. And the second, of all, the second thing is to talk about it. Without a dialogue about it, we'll never make progress. And if we hide it or we ignore it, we'll never fix it and we'll never get easier. So that's my, my challenge for you guys. But the f most important thing, above all of this other stuff, is you have to be shipping your product. If you don't ship your product, your team is going to die, really. Who here has a product that they wish were shipped? If there are no hands raised, y'all are liars. Because all of us have that product that's just almost out there, but you know it's not quite ready. You have to push that product out, because at that point in time, the owners of the product are the users. And the users are much more fun to deal with and much more fun to work with. So that's a challenge that I have for you. But building a team is hard, but it's, it's aggressively worth the difficulty. So, so do that. Let's talk about practicing failure a little bit. Um, failing is hard, and it sucks a lot to fail, right? But if you understand failure, you're likely to understand success. And so we spent a lot of time on the campaign figuring out what failure meant. What were the failure conditions for us in tech? What were the failure conditions for us in the campaign? Um, the first thing we did is user experience. And I cannot say enough about how important user experience is. Who, anyone, any user experience professionals here? OK, there's a row of them. That's weird. Um, <laughs> usually there's like one. And you're just like, oh, how sad. Um, I find it fascinating that we don't talk to the users. We all build products, and we don't talk to the users. And um, I feel like the difference between a functional and a usable app is, is that dialogue. And so we oftentimes relegate uh, user experience people to the corner. Oh, they just talk to users. We'll go you know, figure out their research, and they'll come back and say annoying things. And we really hate them, right? They're almost worse than PMs. <laughs> but the thing is, is that's the only way to build usable applications is to listen to the users. So I don't know why we're not doing that more. Um, A-B testing. Which one do you guys like better? I'm just <laughs> <laughs> Do you guys know this movie? It's a great movie, right? This movie is 100% about multivariate testing. That's all it is. Rewatch it, and you'll just be like, he was a good tester. Um, but the thing about testing is A-B testing, multivariate testing, it allowed us to understand where we were wrong, and we were so wrong. We had the best email team in the world. Um, and they did this thing where every day they would say, OK, here's our list of subject lines. Which one would win? And then they put some money together to bet which subject line would win. Keep in mind, these guys raised $700 million with email. They never once won. The users are crazy, <laughs> right? You have no idea what they're going to pick. You have no idea what's going to convert today with today's weather, with today's environment. Um, and at that point, you, you have to test every day. You can't just test once and think it's going to work. This allowed us to understand how we were wrong. That's so important. Um, there's this idea of fail safety that I think is largely missing from technology. And especially us there at the top, they're the facilitating projects. It's something that you can really help with. Um, I went and saw the space shuttle launch. They had this idea of fail safety, which was there had to be two or three of everything. So if it broke, you could still land the shuttle. Keep in mind, this is shot by a rocket into the sky, into space, and it comes down, and the people don't usually die. This is good. Um, but they practiced the idea of fail safety. How do we do this for our users? So I looked up fail safety, and this is an interesting part right here. Um, Fail safety that will cause no harm or at least a minimum of harm to other devices or danger to personnel. How often are we thinking about how to stop hurting our users? So when you have a 404 page that is not actionable, what does that do to your user? It puts them in a place they cannot leave. If you have a place where they can get where they can't actually do what they want, um, how, do we, how do we solve that? This is, this is crazy. So do not harm your users. Try that out. The most important thing, though, is practice. <coughs> we did this thing called game day. At the end of the campaign, towards the end in October, we basically practiced failure every day. We destroyed constantly all of our applications. Um, I just like that picture. But um, the thing is, is we went through and we said, what happens if DNS is gone? What happens if the databases are down? What happens if this breaks? What happens if that breaks? And we noticed that, that um, this worked or that didn't work, and then we fixed it, and then we, we rerouted around it. But what happened is we created this basically a run book. And so you could actually go to page and you could say, OK, this is what you type in to fix that problem. And then you know, it would work, though. Um, it helped us quantify our limits. 
Um, we had no downtime on election day or near election day. Um, and, you know, it, we didn't fail. It was great. Now, facilitating a community, this is one of the things that is really near and dear to my heart. Um, Threadless was obviously a big community. Um, the campaign was obviously a big community. But it's really hard because the community, we always, we always kind of we kind of push it away. But they're the power behind your brand, and I really think they're the power behind your success. Um, but we always, we always are like, yeah, 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 users. But we can't do that. So how do we facilitate that? How do we make that more powerful and stronger? Um, I think the first thing is authenticity. At Threadless, we did this thing that I found really interesting, and um, we didn't, I don't hear a lot of people doing this. Um, so this is a friend of mine, Charles Festa, and I became friends with him at Threadless. He was a Threadless employee, but largely he was the like platonic form of Threadless user. So every time there is a, a catastrophe at Threadless, he was the first to be like, guys, the users are mad. Or have you thought about how this feature is hurting our users? Or it's hard to check out. He was the first to know this. He was like our canary. Um, thankfully, he didn't die. Um, but he was the authentic user. He was the one we could go to to make sure we weren't screwing up authenticity. And I, I wonder who that is in your environments. Who are the people that you have in your environment that are the person you can go to to say, hey, are we screwing this up? And they can be like, yep, or nope. Purpose. Um, sometimes it's really hard for a brand to, to emote purpose. Um, on the campaign, obviously, this was, this was very easy. You know, this is the president signing health care into law. Um, and now, obviously, the government shut down, so that worked. Um, but, uh, you know, at the time when this happened, everyone was like, yes, I will give money. And it's like you can, you can really kind of push purpose out there. And that's one of the things I really want you guys to think about. How do you emote purpose? Empowerment. This is a little bit related to that, but I'm going to go a little simpler. Um, a lot of the work you guys do on the back end, you can give to your users to do, and they will be excited about it. They'll, be, they'll feel like they're a part of the brand. So here's something that Threadless did. They noticed that some users were uploading kind of crappy designs. So they said, how can we use um, our group of people to help get these designs to be better? So they made this thing called Critique, which allows people to upload contents or, or uh, concepts, version them out, and then get help from the community. This worked out really well. Here's a really simple one. Um, spam reporting and, and like moderation is really a pain in the ass. We see that a lot. But there are people out there that love finding inappropriate content, that love finding spam. Just give them the tools to do it, and they'll do it. And they will say, you know what? I find a lot of spam on Twitter. I love Twitter. They'll say that. They love it. Here's my favorite one, though, and this is the one I talked about earlier. So this page here, this is just an infrastructure company, CloudKick, purchased by Rackspace a couple years ago. The interesting thing is they do this. I wish this page would. And then there's a, a form you can just enter anything in there. Anything. The exciting thing about that is you never know what your users are going to enter. And so it's a great way to understand if errors are happening, if you have user experience problems that maybe people, I wish this page would work. I wish this page would, you know, solve my problem. Um, there's a lot of things you'll find out that people will instantly report. And, and I don't see this anywhere. Like, I, the only place I've ever seen this is on, is on this site. Um, one of the most important things, though, is safety. So here's a question for you guys. How many of you guys know this guy? Right? Okay. So... The troll, let's talk about the troll for a second. So a troll is like a normal person plus anonymity plus audience equals a terrible person. Has anyone seen this before? This is called the John Gabriel's Greater Internet Dickwad Theory. So this is, this is basically it, right? Like any time you have the internet, for some reason, even though people you still do this on Facebook with their real names, they still do it on YouTube. Oh, I love YouTube comments. But they, they do this all the time. And so this is the thing that ruins a lot of our communities. And you have to build in trust. Once again, trust comes in. Um, and it's the hardest thing for the new user because their first experience can't be like this. Immediately an, untrusty pers an untrustworthy person being like, hey, like that can't happen. Um, we end up building, I think a lot of times we end up building communities that end up looking more like this than that. So you have to build that positive neighborhood. You have to build the neighborhood that people want to be a part of. Um, by empowering them and giving them the tools to help protect the neighborhood, they'll flock there. They want to move there. And so create an environment worth trusting, and uh, it'll work out. So in review, build a great team, obviously. Um, practice failure, and then, you know, facilitate community. Um, and that's, uh, uh, oh, yeah, this is the most important one. So ship, ship those products, everyone. Um, that's about it. Thanks, guys. <laughs>